Meeting to order the Kern Council of Government's Transportation Planning Policy Committee. And we'll start with the Pledge of Allegiance. Salute the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call, please. I own. Present. Heckman. That would be here. <laughs> Blades. Present. Crump. Here. Warney. Present. Cryer. Here. Navarro. Here. Crichton. Here. Para. I'm here. Prout. Yes. Reina. I'm here. Scribner. Here taking notes. Yeah, I am. All right, thank you. Bob Smith. I'm here. Phil Smith. Here. Trujillo. Here. And Vasquez. Here. And David Couch will be here shortly. Public comments. This portion of the meeting is reserved for persons to address the committee on any matter not on this agenda but under the jurisdiction of the committee. Committee members may respond briefly to statements made or questions posed. They may ask a question for clarification. Make a referral to staff for factual information or request staff to report back to the committee at a later meeting. Speakers are limited to two minutes. Please state your name and address for the record prior to making a presentation. Are there any public comments? Seeing. Oh, did you have a public comment? <laughs> well, then let's hear it. Don't be shy. Yeah. Uh, it's recorded. I can't sign. I apologize. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so did you say name and address? Yes. Uh, Barbara Paulson, uh, 1600 East Truxton. Uh, honorable members of the Kern County Council of Governments. Uh, my name is Barbara Paulson, and I'm the Workforce Development Program Manager for the Open Door Network. You may know it as the Bakersfield Homeless Center. Uh, Lauren Skidmore, our, C our CEO, apologizes as she cannot be here tonight as she is watching her daughter graduate from preschool. <laughs> I know, I, aww. <laughs> um, since 2009, the Bakersfield Homeless Center has employed current or for formerly uh, homeless individuals in our work program. Thus far, going through our program, we have over 500 persons employed during that time. We are here to speak about some of the um, statistics regarding specifically um, the highway program, which started with a lot of advocacy from a lot of partners and um, big help from Mayor Hall, um, who wanted to just make sure the city and people passing through really had a good experience coming through our city. So he always had groups of volunteers um, that were on the freeways. Many of you might have also volunteered with his groups working <laughs> on the freeway doing that little removal. Um, but he advocated for that. It took a couple of years. We worked with Caltrans, um, solid waste, keep Bakersfield beautiful and got this program started about 10 years ago now. So um, we appreciate that opportunity to, to keep providing um, employment opportunities. So part of what we do is right now we have six crews of six persons working um, with uh, Highway and we employ about 45 to 50 persons at any given time just for that purpose. Um, the crews work on main line to freeway, ramps, west side parkway, and do a lot of um, encampment assistance with cleaning up. Okay. <laughs> um, 
about 30% of our crews are made up of families with young kids. Um, and I always love seeing uh, single parents go off to work and um, they're able to say to their kids, hey, I'll see you after school, I'm off to work. So that is uh, a really proud moment, I think, for a lot of people, especially when they're just entering the workforce. Um, some of the stats we have are, in 2022, we removed 91,147 bags of trash and brush, um, as well as 132 truckloads, which each, each usually consist of up to 200 bags. So that's quite a bit. Um, it averages 350 bags per day. It's a lot of labor happening out there. Um, compare it to 2021, we removed 45,995 bags. Um, so you can see where we have doubled in our efforts in um, assisting our community with trash and litter abatement. Um, we also had, in the year of 2022, 10 people who moved on from our program into full-time jobs because our jobs are, are primarily part-time, which is pretty significant, almost one every month. Um, and then I'm gonna sh have Jamal Musa, who is our crew coordinator, just give you a couple quick success stories if you don't, if you have an extra minute. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I apologize in advance. I might be a little bit nervous because I've never addressed Board of Council of Government. Uh, so just to let you guys know what the success stories we have uh, out there working with the uh, crews that people that are before they had like a substance abuse problems, people that had their kids taken by CPS and all that. We employ those kind of people. Uh, <clears throat> we help them earn a steady paycheck because it's just a regular job where they get paid the minimum wage uh, while they're cleaning the city and the county. Uh, we also have uh, employees who are going from being transient, living couch to couch, struggling with substance abuse, to getting the assistance they need to obtain housing because we also have housing under the Open Door Network uh, to reunite with their kids and their loved ones. And it's got to that point where now their morale is boosted, they have that confidence <laughs> to come back to like the regular jobs where they're actually buying themselves bikes, they're seeing them buying themselves cars, we're seeing them, uh, they're moving into housing, they're getting their kids back, uh, which is actually amazing to see that coming from the streets. Uh, <clears throat> a couple of employees have, have well, when they were using substance abuse and all that, they have come, to, they've got the job. Uh, some of them actually fell in love while working and they have saved money together. They have actually moved into housing together. Now some of the employees are actually thinking about buying houses. This is coming from nowhere, from being on the streets. So this program is actually helping elevate their, their status back in the society. Uh, we also have like to assist them, not just to give them job, we also give them kind of like training, like we have like the Narcan training that we gave them recently, where we have seen when the crews are working, sometimes they, we have like the downtown crew members over here, uh, they're always cleaning, like we call them the poop patrol, where they're cleaning like the feces and the uh, urine. We have seen them uh, see people on the streets and they tell them about the programs that we do. Uh, one time we had a person who was overdosing out here on the streets. And because of the training that we gave them with the Narcan training, they were able to administer that and they actually saved a life before the ambulance got there. So also another thing that I need to mention is also we help them also uh, get with the proper uh, people to get their records expunged because we employ people with, that have their records, uh, that have criminal records. So it's really hard for them to get jobs anywhere else. So we give them that opportunity Get, put the, get them back on their feet and then we help them. We have had some people get their records expunged and once their records are expunged, they can actually get better jobs. So that's just the gist of what we do. But uh, we, currently we have 150 employees uh, and then what Barbara mentioned, 50 of them are going on the freeways where they're 
clearing the litter on the freeways. I'm sure you guys have seen us. We were like on the 58, 99, and all that. So we send them out there. And I think that's pretty much it, unless you guys have any questions. Thank you very much. It, great program and it's a win-win all the way around I think <laughs> you mentioned the numbers from 21 to 22 could you repeat that again it, so it, the amount of pickup is actually increasing or decreasing so every day um, the crews fill out um, slips of where they've gone and the number of bags in the areas that they service um, that gets reported uh, back to Caltrans, Caltrans every day. But, so 2021 was 45,995, so 45,995. And in 2022, 91,147. So we did increase crews as well. So there were more persons doing the work. Um, but we have not seen litter abatement and the need for brush removal, because those bags also would include tumbleweeds, things like that that we do. Um, but we have not seen a decrease in the need and what's out there. So I know many, many years ago, probably the first couple years, so it was probably eight, 10 years ago, the um, Sheriff's Department, I believe, right. was doing an education program within the schools and things. We could see some numbers go down at the very start of that, but because the lack of that and, and due to you know funding, um, we haven't seen anything decrease. There used to be um, that program, the the tarpet, because um, we've probably all seen trash coming out of the back of people's vehicles, not only blatantly dis you know discarding something, but accidentally and not realizing that kind of stuff happens. Um, we do um, uh, have um, some people that work in outlying, or what are the roads? Not 119, but I'm sorry. I'm not good with the roads. <laughs> I'm challenged in that way. No, Kern County. Oh, the KC Cool. Anyway, we do see some um, areas of town where it is more significant, and then we do help a lot more with encampments than I think that we mm -hmm. had done. So that work also encompasses that kind of stuff, and that could explain to the many, many truckloads, you know, Great. of things. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Any other responses? I, I just have one real quick. I was sure. just talking to somebody about this the other day there would be people coming to this meeting coming to council meetings complaining about the trash on the freeways and I haven't I haven't had people or even conversations in you know just with friends you know complaining all the time and I have not seen that lately and it's because of the work that you all are doing to continuously clean up um, that it, it really makes a difference yeah we appreciate that it um, we got to a point where we got to hit all the freeways and everything was done at one time. And now when we see small amounts, it almost seems like, oh, why is the trash there? You know, it, it became something yeah. other than that. Um, but we have a lot of different job crews all doing that. And collectively, it, we need all of them. We really do. We need all of those types of things because it makes our community better. And we want to take pride in where we live. Everybody does, our crews included. Thank you. So. Again, I appreciate it. I think it's a win-win all the way around. <clears throat> Thank you. Can you give me the website that we can find those jobs so I can refer people? Let the record show Supervisor Couch is here. <laughs> and any other public comments? Seeing none, we will move to presentation. Brian Godby, Godby <coughs> Research. Brian, you're up. 
Uh, great, thank you very much. Uh, let me share my screen. Uh, you should all be able to see a blue presentation now uh, and be able to hear me, I hope. So I will dive in. Uh, thank you again uh, for the opportunity to do uh, this uh, interesting project. This is actually the 16th year I was counting them up. Uh, you'll see the years in some of the slides. We won't go through all of them, but uh, we've been at this for a while and, and appreciate the opportunity. Uh, in terms of the research objectives for this particular project, we wanted to look at opinions about the quality of life and the future quality of life in the respondent cities or towns. Uh, we wanted to look at what they like most or least about their communities. Uh, we looked at a variety of issues, a specific list of issues, and to see how much they would impact the quality of life in the future in the county. Uh, we looked at daily commute behavior and telecommuting, uh, and we looked at uh, alternative transportation modes uh, and interest in things like uh, a scooter or an e-bike. Uh, we also looked at housing, and then there, of course is a wide variety of demographic information that we won't really go through tonight, but the full report is 225 pages uh, chock full of that. Uh, and the uh, cross tabs in the appendices are almost another 2,000 uh, pages of different demographic and behavioral characteristics uh, in the county. <clears throat> in terms of the specific methodology, this was a telephone and online survey. Uh, telephone meaning landlines and cell phones, of course. Most of them, uh, of the telephones were cell phone. Landline we keep in there because there are still some people that that's the only way that they'll take a survey. Uh, and then online is obviously online, but it's the result of a text <coughs> invitation. Uh, and that's become the mainstay of our, uh, our interviewing throughout the state. Uh, the universe that we looked at was the adults 18 years or older in Kern County. We were in the field from the middle of February to almost the end, uh, which is our typical time for the survey. Uh, the length was 22 minutes on the phone probably doesn't take that long online, but we don't really know because while we can track when it starts and stops, people couldn't actually, you know, start before lunch, go to lunch, come back and take it and then finish in the afternoon. Uh, so that doesn't tell us really how long it is. So the phone is still our metric for the length of the survey and, and certainly that's a gating factor. Uh, and then in terms of sample size, we completed 1,282 uh, interviews. Uh, our goal each year is 1,200, so we did a little better than that. You can see the breakdown by the various methodologies. There were also 64 interviews completed in Spanish. It was available to anybody who wanted uh, the Spanish version. Uh, and all of that gives us an, a margin of error, plus or minus 2.73 uh, for the overall data. Uh, obviously, that varies when you drill down into all those cross tabs I mentioned earlier. So moving on into the key findings, the first question, as I mentioned, was quality of life. Uh, and here, uh, if you add the green and the gold bars together, uh, you'll see the total satisfied. Uh, and this year it was 56% are satisfied. Uh, there were 27%, 28% in round numbers that were somewhat dissatisfied and 16% that were uh, very dissatisfied. Uh, but on balance, a majority are satisfied. It's down a little bit from 61% in 2022 uh, and uh, up a little bit from 2021, down a little bit from 2020. Uh, and I think what's going on there is obviously, you know, issues related to the pandemic uh, and hopefully we'll see these numbers go up in future years. Uh, I won't go through all of the years, but they are there uh, in your packet available if you're interested. And uh, as I've said, we've done 16 of these, so this goes back to 2008. Uh, the next question is uh, their view of the future quality of life, and this is uh, much better, somewhat better, about the same, uh, somewhat worse, or much worse. And again, if you add the green and the gold bars together, you'll see we're at 27% that think the quality of life will be better, uh, and then another 22% in round numbers I think it'll be about the same. Around 46% in round numbers think it's going to be worse uh, and um, in the future. So, um, you know, it's, uh, I guess, a, a factor of where we are 
uh, you know, given the economy, et cetera. Uh, and, and you can see that that's it's down a little bit from the 2022 in terms of the the better total. Uh, but statistically speaking, there really isn't a difference from that 28.9 to our 27.4. And again, we've got a, a wealth of data here going back to when we started this survey, uh, and, and I won't go in through each year. Uh, the next question was an open-ended one, and it asked people uh, you know, to give us a response rather than us giving them the pre-coded categories. Uh, and this the first question was, what do you like most about your uh, city or town? Uh, and for the last few years, it has been cost of living. It is still cost of living, uh, just slightly ahead of small town atmosphere. Uh, obviously, the two are probably not dissimilar or somewhat related. Uh, and then the third one, cost of uh, housing. Uh, obviously, cost of living, cost of housing are opposite sides of the same coin. Uh, so those are the top three. Also in the 30s, in terms of the responses, you see location. Uh, so they like where they live, uh, and they like the atmosphere, and they like the cost of living is what it comes down to. Uh, the next tier is the bottom four items, uh, and that's natural resources, outdoor recreation, rivers, et cetera, sense of community, farming and agricultural and cultural diversity uh, in, again, their, their particular town. Uh, this went on. There were more responses, but here we're starting to get into the teens. Uh, and then into the, the single digit numbers uh, with uh, weather and climate, safe neighborhoods, quality of education, et cetera. Uh, we looked at the other side of the coin, which is what do you like least about uh, your community? And you can see for the last few years, the top response has been homelessness. Uh, it's up a little bit from the 2022 uh, survey, it's 20, uh, 55.5 now, it was 51.2. With that margin of error that we talked about at the beginning, which is plus or minus, it's technically not a statistically significant difference, but it's gone up a little bit. And, and we've seen that here in Kern, uh, as you can see from the data, but we've also seen the exact same thing everywhere else in the county, in the state where we've asked this question. So this is not a, an outlier by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, I recently did a survey in Concord in the Bay Area and homelessness was uh, almost the exact same 55% uh, was the top issue of concern. Uh, next is crime rate in general at 51%, then air quality at 44% in round numbers, uh, and then uh, gang violence uh, rounds out the top four. From there, we dropped down quite a bit. Uh, cost of living is a concern to some people, even though we saw uh, in the previous slides that other people think the cost of living is one of the things they like about their community. So obviously, uh, the economy and housing affordability are important. This next slide uh, goes through the rest of the items, uh, again, at lower numbers uh, in the low 20s and teens, job opportunities, traffic congestion. Uh, and it's good to see in this question that traffic congestion is you know, the lower, it's on the top of this list by any stretch of the imagination, so that's encouraging. Uh, then uh, youth programs, uh, obviously they want more something different. Um, public transportation, uh, farmland, loss of to development. Uh, and then the others are not sure. So the next set of questions, uh, if you look at the full report, is uh, takes a tremendous amount of space, and I'm trying not to do that here uh, because it's fairly complicated. Uh, these are the top uh, seven uh, or so of the of the 20 issues that we tested, and to see how important they were to the future quality of life. Uh, they are largely the same list that they were before in 2022, uh, but the order has changed a little bit. Uh, at the top this year, preserving the uh, water supply is the number one issue. That's almost 92% uh, saying that it is extremely important uh, or very important uh, in, on our scale of four to zero. Uh, and then we have... Um, improving the quality of public education, which is again, throughout the state, almost always in the top grouping. 
uh, and then improving crime prevention and gang prevention programs round out the top tier. The next grouping is statistically a little bit different, improving water quality, maintaining local streets and roads, creating more high paying jobs, uh, air quality, uh, improving fire and emergency medical services and improving local health care. So switching gears at this point, less quality of life and going into more transportation. The first is mode choice. And we ask people what's their primary type of transportation that they use to go to work or school. Uh, and at the top of the list, uh, as it has been for the last several, well, as long as we've been asking the question, uh, and certainly the last several years is drive alone. It's 71.3% this year, down a little bit from last year. Uh, but again, statistically, that is not significant. It's really tied. Uh, it was 68, 67, 68, and then 64 in round numbers in previous years. Uh, retired is around 10 or 11% uh, in round numbers. Uh, car, van, pool, single digits at 8% this year, walking 5%. Uh, telecommuting in this first question, and you'll see there's another telecommuting question later on, where we sort of push the issue a little bit more. Uh, but here it was 5% uh, of the people saying it's their primary transportation used to get to work or school. Uh, then Uber, Lyft, rideshare services, uh, and then uh, autonomous or self-driving cars, which is uh, something we started asking uh, before. Um, and obviously there's a question in some people's minds, you know, what is a, an autonomous a fully autonomous versus some some features on certain newer cars uh, that you know control not only cruise control but lane control that sort of thing. Okay, and oops, sorry about that. Uh, and then the remainder of this question, all, all small single digits, uh, expressed shuttle bus, electric vehicle, uh, bike, e-bike, uh, sharing services. Um, on-demand, curb-to-curb, uh, taxi, and on down the list. So the next question specifically said, would you consider riding a scooter or an e-bike uh, as your primary mode of transportation? And virtually the same as in 22, uh, we had 24.3% say this year that they would consider riding a scooter or an e-bike as their primary mode of transportation. Uh, again, there's lots of detailed cross tabs to find out who exactly those are, uh, but I won't, won't go into that today. Uh, the next question then asked people if they would consider riding a scooter or an e-bike as part of another mode of transportation. Uh, so this certainly is higher. Uh, it jumps up to 32%, 32.4 specifically, down a little bit from 2022. But again, statistically not significant. It's virtually the same. So uh, it is more popular, uh, at least potentially, among the uh, people who would do it as part of another problem. Uh, so the next question was uh, asking the people who didn't say telecommuting or working from home in the initial mode choice, again, uh, would you or could you telecommute uh, or do you telecommute or work from home? Uh, and so in this case, it's a smaller base, but 19% said that they would. If we add those 19% and the actual number of people who responded to this, together with the previous, we have 273 uh, people in the survey, or about 21% uh, that are telecommuters work from home uh, at the high water mark. Uh, the next question asked those people, that same 273 from both of those questions, uh, how many days a week they would work, uh, or could, I'm sorry, how many days a week they could telecommute. Uh, and um, the 9% said one day, 12% in round numbers two, 11% three, this is percent of that 21%, so it's not of the total. Uh, uh, seven percent said four, and thirty-seven uh, percent said five days a week. Then we tail off from there. So, the people of the people that are telecommuting, uh, they are telecommuting certainly, or working from home, uh, almost uh, five-day work week, not exclusively, but 
uh, because some are more than five days and some are a little less, uh, it, it centers around that five day period. Uh, and if you compare that even just by sort of drawing a line uh, from the end uh, right side of the five day down, uh, you see that that's actually gone up from 2022. Uh, so that, that was certainly an in, uh, interesting statistic. Uh, the next question asked those that same group of people, again, this is the 21% of the total, so these percentages are of 21%, uh, what the number one reason to continue to telecommuting or working from home, and number one was saving money at 23, number two was my company requires me to do it at 19, uh, saving time was third, and saving gas was uh, fourth. Uh, between the saving money and saving gas, probably the same issue, uh, just expressed differently. You know, we're looking at 35 uh, percent in round numbers. Uh, that their motivation is simply to save money. Now, the next question is asked of the people that we haven't been talking about. This is the people that said that they didn't or wouldn't telecommute. Uh, and we said, well, how many days could you if you if you decided to? Uh, and you can see the breakdown here is fairly small uh, of this group of people, which is essentially 79% of the population in total. Only about 22% of that 79% uh, would telecommute between one and five days if you add the small numbers together there. Uh, if you do the math uh, and uh, say it's 80, 20 percent in round numbers of 80 percent. That's about 16 to 17 percent of the population uh, in total that could telecommute between one and five days a week, but currently are not. Uh, asking again that same group of people who are not telecommuting, uh, what would be the number one reason to telecommute? Again, saving gas and saving money are our top two responses, 19 and 18% in round numbers, uh, then 9% saving the environment, and then another 8% saying a uh, company requiring them, uh, and then 8% uh, would be just saving time. The next question then turned to the rating of the traffic flow in their community. And again, if you add the excellent and good, which is the green and the blue portions of the bars together, you'll see that about 35% said that it is um, excellent or good, about 48% uh, said that it is fair, and 16% said that it is um, poor. Um, that 16% is uh, somewhat lower, statistically significantly, than 2022, which the response was 24%. Again, this could be something to do with the pandemic. The, the survey in 2024 was also done in February, so that's before we started seeing California shut down. Um, so there, I guess, silver lining, if you will, that there are fewer people that are saying the commute is, uh, traffic rating is bad. Uh, and this is the remainder of the years. Uh, again, I won't go through all of them. Uh, so of those people that told us that they were commuting uh, by driving alone, we said, well, what would be your most likely alternative uh, to driving alone? And uh, the largest group, again, 63%, virtually the same as last year, said driving alone. So it's going to be hard to get those people out of their cars. Um, we added a new category of electric vehicle this year, so 20% said they might, uh, uh, as an alternative, start driving an electric vehicle, um, depending on you know, their choice there. Uh, another 23% in round numbers said electric vehicle if charging stations were available at their workplace. Uh, then 17% said car van pool. Uh, another 17% said bike or electric bike. Uh, and 12% said uh, express bus service. Again, we have other responses that were single digits, um, uh, not including the don't work outside the home uh, and down the list. And that list continues. 
uh, with a variety of other items, but they're well within the margin of error. So that's the transportation section. The next section was the housing type uh, and first, uh, or housing section. First question was, what type of housing do you currently live in? Uh, and 36% uh, in round numbers said that they live in a single family home with a small yard. 47% uh, said single family home with a large yard. 4% uh, said a townhome or a condominium. These are all numbers that are statistically the same as uh, previous years. There really hasn't been much, much change uh, from a statistical perspective. Uh, the remaining ho um, housing types, uh, a mixed use condominium on the upper floors uh, with offices and uh, stores on the first floor uh, or an apartment at 12% uh, and then don't know was again, single digits. Now we asked people uh, again, what their preference would be uh, if they were to have a choice or an option. Uh, and in this survey, 33% uh, said uh, they would prefer a, a single family home. Uh, and um, in the next category, single family home with a large yard was 57%. Actually, you can add the top two boxes again together, and that's uh, the definitely and, and probably categories. Um, and then when we look at townhomes, you see that's 12, 13 plus 28. Uh, in terms of townhomes, and then mixed use is nine plus nine, so it's 28 uh, in round numbers that are probably yes or definitely yes. Uh, and then the apartment dwellers is about 29% uh, that, uh, again, definitely or probably yes. Uh, what's interesting to do is take that data and look at it um, in a cross tab fashion. Uh, and so this is uh, what is your preference by where you live now. So where you live now um, is the columns. So this first two rows here, uh, first two columns are people who currently live in a single family home with a small yard. And then I've highlighted the total yes that would move to one of these other options. So uh, if they had the opportunity, so of those people that live in a single, small, single family home with a small yard, 81% would continue to live in that same configuration. Of those people, another 79 or 79% would opt up for a large yard. So that, those numbers are about the same. Uh, very few of the single family small yard residents would make a switch to a town home uh, or a mixed use uh, project or an apartment. Uh, those people that live in a large home then, uh, well, uh, it is certainly more than a majority, 64%, it's a smaller number of those people would switch to a smaller yard, so downsizing, but uh, of the, that same group of people, 85% would stay with their uh, single family large yard home. Those that are currently living in a townhouse or condominium, 92% would opt for a small yard home, 77% uh, a large yard home, and 78% would stay in the townhouse and condominium. So that it's, uh, if they're gonna make a change, that group of people is more likely to go to a, a small yard single family home. And the, uh, multi-use projects are a pretty small number. There are lots of zeros, obviously, so it doesn't really matter. Uh, and then the apartment, uh, there's a big chunk of those people that currently live in an apartment that will go to a single family, small yard, uh, somewhat less to a large yard. Um, and um, the biggest, and a big chunk of them would go for a town home or condo. Uh, next question was just simply, do you own or rent your home? Uh, numbers obviously are pretty stable, 37% rent, 58% uh, 58 sorry, uh, own uh, currently, uh, and again, pretty stable across the years. Uh, but we asked that question there because the next question was, would you consider living in a home that shares your lot with uh, another house or living in a duplex? Uh, and we're obviously setting these questions up with that rent, own rent question. 
So 28% said that they would consider living in a in a shared situation, either a house on two houses on one lot or a duplex. Um, but the vast majority, 61%, said no, they wouldn't consider that. That's up from 2022. And that is a statistically significant difference. Uh, the related question then, again, was uh, would you consider, for, if you owned your home, would you consider building a, a second dwelling unit or converting your home to a duplex? Um, and again, this is of just those people that own homes. So 27% said that they would. Uh, that's down just a fraction from 2022. Uh, and again, the majority uh, at a fairly stable 53% in round numbers in both of the last two years. So that's uh, the presentation I have for this evening. I'm certainly happy to answer any questions that you might have, or of course there is a, uh, a much more detailed report uh, coming your way. Thank you, Brian. I just, on the telecommute, was a little confusing to me. You had 3% that actually telecommute, but then you added 19% that maybe would, or they actually well, do? The, the survey was structured to ask, what's your primary mode of uh, let me get the pull up the actual question here. Uh, we first asked um, in question six, what's your primary uh, transportation mode to work or school? Um, and in that question, which is one that we've been asking since the beginning, uh, you could still say you know, my primary mode is when I'm going to work is to drive. Uh, and certainly a large portion do that. Um, but you could also sort of say, oh, I drive sometimes and sometimes I work from home. So we got a, a chunk of the people that said they work from home. It was that small number that you said uh, to the primary mode of transportation. Then later on, we sort of forced the issue again of the rest of the people, again, not the people that said they telecommute, uh, and said, do you telecommute or work from home? So it's a little bit different question, and we're just trying to come at it in a couple different angles to try to figure out, you know, what's the most that could be telecommuting uh, out there currently, uh, and that's why it comes up to 21% when we add those two questions together. So 21% are actually telecommuting at least one day a week? Yeah, that's right. And how's that? compared to when you first started in 16? Yeah, we didn't actually start that until, th this is a, a variation on a question that we ask in uh, the pre, during the pandemic. Um, so, it, and the way we were asking it was associated with COVID. So we're sort of trying to separate ourselves from the COVID numbers. Um, so, it, because it was just different, uh, you know, and it was kind of because of COVID, are you telecommuting? And we wanted to get away from that in this survey uh, and sort of start a clean slate. So I don't have that uh, a real comparison. So prior to COVID, you didn't ask telecommute? No, no, we did not. The, the trend towards more pessimistic answers in the general questions in the beginning, is that statewide? Is that uh, yeah, I mean, it varies from community to county to county, but I, I would say yes, it is statewide. I, you know, I think that uh, what we saw is when the pandemic began, uh, precipitous drops everywhere. Counties, cities, school districts, uh, it leveled off uh, midway through and has improved a little bit uh, here and there. But you know, now we're again looking at high inflation, and so we've sort of traded one problem for the next one, uh, and, and it's sort of kept the, a lid on improvement, unfortunately. Thank you. Anybody else have any comments, questions? I have a question real quick. Um, I saw you had a, um, asked the question about uh, Uber and Lyft, but as far as public transit, have you asked the question for the on-demand services and public transit was i didn't hear that it yeah was in there? um get was uh, which i think is one of yours um is uh i mean we didn't ask separate questions about this but the primary mode of transportation had uh uber lyft at five percent 
um, and it had get on demand curb to curb at 1.3 percent. Okay. Thank you. I'm sorry, I missed that. Oh no, that's it was a small part of the bar. <laughs> Not a problem. Thank you. Any other questions? Miss, Mr. Chairman, I just wanted yes. to let the board know that this is the full report is already on our website, so it is available at kerncog.org. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Godby. Good to see you again. Thank you. Nice to see everybody. Hope you, hope you say well. <coughs> item four, consent agenda opportunity for public comment. All items on the consent agenda are considered to be routine and non-controversial by KernCog staff and will be approved by one motion of no member of the council or public wishes to comment or ask questions. If comment or discussion is desired by anyone, the item will be removed from the consent agenda and will be considered in the listed sequence with an opportunity for any member of the public to address the council concerning the item before action is taken. Any public comment on the consent agenda? Seeing none, can I have a motion? Motion to consent. Second. Second. Roll call vote. Vasquez. Yes. Trujillo. Yes. Yes. Bill, Bill Smith. Yes. Bob Smith. Yes. Raina. Yes. Prout. Yes. Para. Yes. Crichton. Yes. Navarro. Yes. Cryer. Yes. Warney. Yes. Crump. Yes. Blades. Aye. Couch. Yes. And Ion. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Caltrans Report District 6, Mr. Navarro. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good evening, members of the board. Uh, a few updates before I get into projects. I know last month I told you it was the last call for Clean California Cycle 2, but it was extended to May 31st. Um, that's the $100 million call for local grants program. So if you were proactive and submitted your application ahead of the, the due date, you do have time to withdraw your application and enhance it further if need be. Uh, if you're very comfortable with your application, then, um, then you're already ahead of the game. So I wanted to share that with you. Also, just a reminder, the, the state highway to boulevards program, we're expecting that call to go out here either end of this month or early June. Uh, they're calling this a call for communities. There's $149 million available. So they'll be looking at uh, selecting three communities through this call. Uh, they'll be looking at an urban, a rural, and then a corridor uh, and looking at ways to enhance a community that's impacted by, um, divided by highways or infrastructure. Also, another reminder about the Safe Streets and Roads for All program through USDOT. That NOFO is out through July 10th. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. Happy to assist. Uh, with maybe and Bike Punch, just wanted to share that Caltrans, we had our Bike to Work Day today. Um, I participated as well. We had about 40 of us on a train riding into work today. Probably the average rider rode about 10 to 12 miles on their commute. I think our longest rider was a little over 20 miles. So it was a really good event, probably the best turnout we've had in, in years. So excited to share that. You also, biked all the way down here? I did not. I did not, unfortunately. We don't, we don't allow bicycles on 99. Otherwise, I would have. No, good one. And then just wanted to share, give you a heads up. Um, start having conversations with, with my staff this week about uh, looking at State Route 58 west of 99. Um, so we'll, we'll be reaching out to the city of Bakersfield and Kern County and just want to have conversations about strategies for, for access management along the Stockdale Highway to preserve that corridor as well as the future stay route 58 so in the early conversations with my team uh, we'll be reaching out to your respective staffs to continue these conversations so we can collaborate work on corridor preservation on that segment of 58 and stockdale highway um, as for projects work continues on uh stay route 99 for old from old us 99 to white lane the rehab project uh, that project is expected to be completed in fall of 2023 uh, we've had a, a couple meetings with um internally regarding the state route 43 7th standard road roundabout so at this point we're, we're trying to wrap up environmental and the plan is for, for caltrans to take the lead on that for doing right, right going after right away and construction funding and applying for cmac funds going forward for that project um, we recently had a meeting with city of shafter um, expressing our plans and having conversations on on the need for the roundabout project so right now the critical path we're working on is once we get environmental done is, is the right away process uh, stay on the tune of roundabout santa fe roundabout so we are in the design phase 
we anticipate having that project ready to list uh, April of next year and hopefully begin construction the following spring. Uh, the State Route 46 project, Segment 4B, which is a segment west of the California Aqueduct. Uh, no major changes out there to roadway construction, and we're scheduled for completion end of this year. Uh, work continues uh, moving forward to get ready for the Segment 4C, which is a segment west of Browns Material Road. Uh, I think I indicated last month that bids were opened on April 19th, and the lowest bidder was granite construction, and the bids came in about 4.3% under the engineer's estimate. So we'll be looking at uh, hopefully summer or fall for construction of that project. Uh, the 184 Sunset Roundabout, um, that, we expect that project to open probably in the next few weeks, uh, still wrapping up some electrical work to get that uh, open to traffic. We did open the roundabout at State Route 223 and 184 recently. Mm -hmm. It opened last week. Um, there's still some punch list items I'm working on, but that roundabout is open to traffic. Uh, State Route 184, 184, the Morning Drive morning drive rehab project um, that project uh, went to CT was sent to CTC this month which I believe was today uh, request for construction allocation was submitted for for that project and that project is the rehab project that will include multiple you know completing sidewalks and complete street elements will be included as part of that project and with that that completes my report I'm happy to answer any questions you may have thank you I had a couple of the, the Union Avenue Hawk signal did that ever get working it was installed but somehow had trouble getting through. yeah there was some some challenges I, I i didn't get an update before this meeting on that it's not showing that it was apologies try to get a text message out and haven't got a response back but um i will follow up like i can contact you directly if that's okay great appreciate it and then also the union avenue bike lane stuff that was going to start this summer this summer correct i think we're looking at uh i think it was july we anticipated um going out to construction uh let me double check i know definitely this summer i think we're looking at july if I'm not mistaken, for the Union Avenue for the, uh, yeah, that was ready to advertise by April 30th. Or we expected to award probably end of this month and get contract approved end of June. Um, so I'm going out June, July, right. and that'll be the road diet with the bike lanes, correct? Very good, yes. And then I had asked you, and, and maybe you told me I didn't remember, the, uh, the possibility of eastbound bike lane underneath 99 on Rosedale, uh, similar to what we did on the westbound and i think your answer was that might not be caltrans maybe i think the segment we talked about last was gonna right. when we took look, look back it wasn't caltrans right away okay it is not caltrans correct is it so yeah. it's city right there? correct yeah i checked i checked back with our maintenance operation folks and they indicated that would that would be a local road improvement okay great mm -hmm. thank you any other questions comments for yes um i know it's not part of uh, your presentation but i'm getting a lot of questions as to the trees that were uprooted on 223 um, that were bringing up the, the the sidewalk when are we getting trees put back to replace the ones that were um, all removed uh, okay. from from Comanche to, to Derby on 223 I'll need to look in that I'm not aware of the trees that were being removed so I'd, I'll have to inquire yeah thank you and I'd like to ask a question to Michael. Uh, can you repeat the deadline for the um, the new deadline for clean California grant? That's the end of this month. It'll be May 31st. And one more, mar one more question, if I may. Um, is it possible that Caltrans can install bike lanes on Highway 43 through Wasco? I would have to take a closer look at that. Would you? Yeah. Thank you. I have a question. Smith. Yes. Uh, on Highway 58, I brought it up, but it's been a while. Uh, but just east of uh, Tower Line Road to just east of Comanche, uh, where it hits the good pavement, is there any update on uh, that very, very rough road section that's going to be addressed anytime soon? So it's westbound 58, right hand lane. Everybody avoids it and they get upset with you because you're hanging in the left lane, but there's a big reason. And they find out as soon as they pass. Okay, I'll have to follow up with our maintenance folks on that one as well. All right, thank you. Any other questions, comments for District 6? Thank you very much. District 9 report, please. Hey, good evening, can you hear me? Yes. All right, thank you. So Mark Heckman, 
uh, sitting in. Uh, so I wanted to bring up um, right now, District 9 is really involved with snow removal operations and avalanche mitigation and spring runoff. I will put in the chat uh, what's going on in that in our district with that regard. Um, project updates this is probably important. So Freeman 3 Cap M, which is just north of Red Rock Canyon State Park, that went into construction this week. There's going to be one lane, one way of reversing traffic control, and there will be a flagger. 20 minute delays and this project's going through till August 1st. Uh, we also got a State Route 58 emergency slab replacement. And this is gonna be between Keene and just east of Tucker Road. And we're not sure the exact start date, but it's coming any day now. Uh, we're also gonna be doing a bridge repair. It's, and that's going to be on State Route 58 as well at three different locations. And that's going to probably begin May 26th, which I think would be right, around, right after Memorial Day. And we're doing a bunch of pothole work between Tehachapi and Mojave this week. So just be aware. And then Rosamond Rehab number two, we're working on the PID and we're also anticipating that the PID will be completed in June. Uh, up by Tehachapi, Cummins Valley Road intersection, that project is officially complete and accepted. Uh, also, we started the work on the Rosamond Zero Skate project. That is a Clean California project. And we're anticipating completion of that in June and the mojave pavement we just wrapped up the public comments and we're hoping to have the environmental document completed in june as well uh also yeah thank you mike uh i was going to mention the clean california grant extended and uh, that's it for district nine uh, do you anyone have any questions great thank you any questions for district nine Uh, just a, just a thank you for the continuing uh, roadside cleanup uh, crews in our area and then uh, East Kern toward Mojave and around Tashby. It, it really does it does show, and those they're out there all the time. Yep. Thank you. Any other questions? Hearing none. Thank you, District Nine. Executive Director's report. Good evening, Mr. Chairman and board members. I have a few items to report on on this agenda. The CTC met yesterday and this morning in San Francisco. Uh, Kern Cog did have an item on the agenda uh, regarding the project at uh, on 46, right at the San Luis Obispo County line. It was approved, uh, and it will go before the CTC again in June for second approval. And I will let you know when and if that is approved, but I anticipate it being approved. Uh, clean Air Month luncheon date that was previously on the timeline for May 25th is now May 31st. If you're interested in attending that luncheon, please contact Linda Urata or me. Uh, over the past uh, month, I've continued to have meetings with Caltrans and our other partners about State Route 58 and 99. I'm glad to report that the eastbound 58 to northbound connector is on schedule to go out to bid this fall. That's good news. 204 on Union Avenue, as Michael reported, is, is proceeding. Severn Standard and 43. Um, Michael, I may be able to give you some help on the right of way from Kern County. Um, consultant we have who used to work for the city of Bakersfield just finished up work on 46. Uh, we had the State Route 46 status meeting today. Good news, um, if you've been through there recently, you, s you may have seen the pedestrian overcrossing, bright green pistachio-colored uh, overcrossing is fully open to the public. Um, the roadway construction is wrapping up, and the final piece through the oil fields will start work in the next few months. 
And finally, the most exciting news, um, I will start and then I'll turn it over to Councilman Smith in just a, a, few, a few seconds. Uh, earlier this month, I attended a meeting with uh, Senator Shannon Grove, the director of Caltrans, statewide director, also the district director for District 9, um, Councilman um, Phil Smith from City of Tatchby, his city manager and city engineer, and I will let uh, Phil share the, the great news. Councilman Smith, oh, excuse me. Well, we're real pleased that uh, we're making some progress, uh, getting some support for District 9, I think from District 6 on some of the, the ongoing uh, engineering parts of it. Uh, I did make a note out of that meeting uh, with the new director of Caltrans that uh, Tony Tavares said this uh, route, the truck climbing lanes, uh, he said extremely significant. That was his, his words. And then Ryan's <coughs> words from District 9 were that this is the most important route in District 9. So we're just going to, I'm going to post those up and keep them there for uh, just to keep everybody aware. But we're very pleased that uh, we're engaged uh, with you folks and 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 Caltrans uh, uh, higher levels uh, to keep this in focus to keep it moving along and uh, we appreciate all the efforts on that thank you thank you Phil so, so the uh, thank you Councilman Smith so the, the bottom line is Caltrans director has committed to include the truck climbing lanes in Caltrans shop project that will start construction in um, 2026. We will work with Caltrans to try to accelerate that to 2025 if we can, but great news. This is uh, over 20 years of effort. Many thanks to uh, councilmen and mayor in the past, Smith, and all of you as elected officials who've advocated for that work, and especially to um, Senator Grove and the reason why we we involved Senator Grove was like in the federal government um, heads of, of agencies in the state have to be confirmed by the Senate so the new director of Caltrans had to be confirmed by uh, a Senate committee first which Senator Grove is on and then the full Senate so we went to Senator Grove she listened to our concerns brought it up with the head of Caltrans and he listened and responded. So great news. And uh, subject to any of your question, that concludes my report, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Yes, that's important for all of us. Uh, any other comments, questions for the director? Seeing none, that meeting is adjourned, and I will open the Kerncog board meeting. Roll call is the same. And any public comments? for the current COG meeting. Seeing none, consent agenda opportunity for public comment. Seeing none, can I have a motion? Motion no, to consent. Second. Roll call vote, please. Ion. Aye. Couch. Yes. Blades? Aye. Crump? Yes. Cryer? Yes. Crichton? Yes. Prout? Yes. Raina? Yes. Bob Smith? Yes. Phil Smith? Yes. Trujillo? Yes. And Vasquez? Yes. Thank you. Final Kern Cog fiscal year 23-24 financial plan. That would be me. Whoops. Um, before you tonight is the final Kern Cog uh, fiscal year 2023-24 financial plan. This uh, represents everything that it was in the OWP that you uh, adopted last month. And uh, the most significant uh, change is that this year we um, reduced consultant fees by 40%. And what we're asking for you to do tonight is open a public hearing, receive comments, close the public hearing, and then adopt the 
final Kern Cog fiscal year 2023 24 financial plan. Thank you. Thank you. I will open the public hearing. Any public comments? Seeing none, I will close the public hearing and ask for a motion. Motion to approve. Second. Second. Roll call vote, please. Vasquez. Yes. Trujillo. Yes. Phil Smith. Yes. Bob Smith. Yes. Reyna. Yes. Prout. Yes. Crichton. Yes. Cryer. Yes. Crump. Yes. Blades. Aye. Couch. Yes. And Ion. Aye. Very good. Item five. Yes, this is uh, the counterpart to the Kern Cog budget. This is the KMAA uh, financial plan for 23-24. Um, it includes the uh, debris removal for the county and the city. It also funds our 511 uh, maintenance contract. And we also put some in there for the um, CHP. And again, we just ask you to open the public hearing, receive comment, close the public hearing, and adopt the financial plan. Thank you. Thank you. I will open the public hearing. Any public comments? Seeing none, I will close the public hearing and ask for motion. Motion to approve. Second. Who seconded? Thank you. Roll call vote, please. Ion? Aye. Couch? Yes. Blades? Aye. Crump? Yes. Cryer? Yes. Crichton? Yes. Prout? Yes. Reyna? Yes. Bob Smith? Yes. Phil Smith? Yes. Trujillo? Yes. And Vasquez? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Executive Director's Report. Just one quick item on this agenda, Mr. Chairman and board members. I attended, as well as one CONCOG staff member also attended with me, the San Joaquin Valley Policy Conference, which occurred April 24th to 26th in Manteca. It was uh, well attended. There were uh, several dozen uh, elected officials and appointed officials from throughout the state. I also ran into the mayor of Shafter who was there and their city manager. Yeah. Um, had many uh, conversations with people who I would uh, otherwise not have the time to talk to face to face, which I think is the biggest uh, value of these conferences. I had 20, 25 minute conversation with the head of the CTC head of FHWA, and uh, on, on and on. Uh, in your folder this evening is a timeline covering May 2023 to September 2023, an update from Bike Bakersfield on the work they're doing for us on our uh, ATP grant. Ooh, this is uh, some, some good news. I brought it to you in the past and continue to bring it to you. Oh, I lost my reading glasses. Here they are. This is the blue and um, light blue and yellow um, document. It shows Kern, Kern Cog leading the state in delivery of um, federal transportation programs. So thank you to all of you for leaning on your staffs. We we're in the middle of May, and we've delivered 130 percent of our allocation. And what that means is we're, we're spending other people's money. Starting, starting a April 1st, uh, I'm sorry, May 1st, uh, we get to use other people's money. And uh, typically August 1st, we get to use other states' money. So great job. It's great to uh, be in this position. This is where I've, I've uh, wanted to take us with your direction for years. And I hope, hope we stay there for a long time to come. And finally, the schedule of cash disbursements um, for March 2023. 
Subject to any of your questions, Mr. Chairman and board members, that concludes my report. Thank you. Any questions for the director? Seeing none, any member statements? Yes, Ms. Barr. I just wanted to thank uh, Councilman Smith for joining Bike Bakersfield on our Bike to Work Day yesterday. And I'd like to thank Caltrans, Mr. Navarro, for you all buying into to this every year. It seems like your Bike to Work Day gets bigger and bigger. And um, Councilman from Wasco, Mr. Reyna, thank you for joining us on Wasco's Bike to Work Day. Uh, we hope to grow it in the future. And also remember that GET is still celebrating its 50th <coughs> anniversary. And um, there will be little pop-ups around town with uh, gifts, giveaways, drinks at all of the <coughs> transit centers. Tomorrow we will, um, Bike Bakersfield will be having uh, commuter stands, one at uh, the CSUB bridge. Kern Cog staff is going to be nice enough to man that one for us, Suzanne Campbell and Bob Snotty. Uh, we also have one at Beach Park and one in Oildale. So that's it. Thank you. Any other statements? Hearing none, we will adjourn to closed session. So we are back from closed session and we adjourn closed session that that's correct uh, we met in closed session and there was no reportable action taken thank you and now we are adjourned <laughs>